So my name is Thomas Martin. I'm the founder and CEO of Big Co Small Co. And so we are a technology integrator that brings uh, startup technology and innovative technologies to the big company enterprise. Uh, previously, I was a CIO and CTO across multiple GE industrial businesses and had the pleasure of leading the effort to migrate over 9,000 uh, workloads to public cloud. And today I'm here with Brian Johnson. Hi, my name is Brian Johnson. I'm the CEO and co-founder at Divi Cloud. Uh, prior to taking on this journey, I worked at Electronic Arts for about seven and a half years working on massive multiplayer online games, deploying a lot of those games around data centers around the world and led the charge into migration to cloud in about 2013. Very cool. All right, well. So through that process of the migration, one of the things that we thought was really interesting is that as we adopted cloud, we started treating it like a technology problem. But at the end of the day, that actually wasn't the case. Right? At the end of the day, it was actually a culture problem. And what we realized is that shift to self-service was incredibly important for our ability to compete. All of our competitors are out there building games and doing it much faster and getting those products to market and learning from their, from their customers and building really cool games. How could we continue to do that? How could we continue to innovate? Well, we couldn't do that if IT continued to get in the way. So we needed to find a way to allow our engineering organizations to access cloud, to be able to deploy applications, to innovate through their cloud infrastructure without security and IT really getting in the way of that. And through that process, what we discovered is it wasn't just a technology problem, right? It was actually three things that came together in this sort of perfect storm that caused an issue for security. Number one, yeah, we were moving, we have more, right? Just more everything. We have more servers. So we were moving from, you know, 500 servers, although that was not the actual number, you know, thousands of servers to tens and 20,000s of instances inside of AWS. So that, and, and GCP. So that was really interesting through that process. And then we also had this mechanism where the number of people touching the infrastructure dramatically increased. It wasn't just the IT staff anymore. It was thousands of engineers all over the globe touching infrastructure, deploying applications, which led to the third thing. We were no longer server huggers, right? We were basically having change every day, CI, CD process. One little code change, a bug fix, tear everything down, rebuild it back again. So that led to just a dramatic increase in the number of changes that were occurring in the infrastructure at any given moment. So these three things combined, number of resources you had to manage, number of people touching those resources, and how often those resources were changing led to this incredibly difficult problem. How did we deal with this scale? How could we possibly, as an organization, understand everything that was changing and react to it in any reasonable amount of time based on traditional IT and security processes we had in place, which were you know, super slow? So that was really the problem we see out there. This is not a technology issue. This is a company transformation issue. How do you get ahead of this, and how do you deal with scale? So with that, let's just kind of talk about, I mean, what does this really begin to mean from a practical aspect, right? I mean, fairly simple, right? This is just a simple three-tier architecture. The, mis the opportunities actually seem quite small, right? I mean, you've just got a couple, uh, you've got a load balancer, a couple computes, you know, spanning across a couple, uh, a couple of availability zones. We've got a uh, cloud storage and cloud SQL. The point is, is if you're just managing it in a small scale with a single team, not all that hard, right? But really, when you start looking at it, there's at least 20 plus opportunities for misconfiguration, just in this simple three-tier architecture. Think about that when you begin to migrate, say five, seven, 10,000 applications across an enterprise. To try to manage this at any kind of scale just becomes unwieldy. And what I found was actually for ourselves, in my past experience has really been somewhere between about 100 and 200 applications, the team, this the whole structure starts to fall down. You really have to begin to think about, not only is that CI CD process so important, but it's really about all the configurations, not only real time upon deployment, but ongoing and on forward. So uh, what does this lead to? Well, in our case, it led to a couple of different things. It led to loss of control. Right, we're letting engineers go and, and sort of deploy. And that's a great thing, right? You want that innovation. You need that innovation. In order to survive as a company, you've got to find a way to compete through innovation. So that was really important, but you lose control, right? It used to be that any change that was going to be made in the infrastructure went through us first. So we would know a problem. We would see a mistake. We'd be able to stop it from happening. That's not necessarily the case anymore. And furthermore, what's interesting is this happened really quickly, all things considered. So it means that you went from having an IT organization who had processes in place to be able to catch these issues through the sort of controls and gateways it had, 
to engineers just doing all sorts of things all over the place. And the problem is nobody ever sat down the engineering organization and explained to them 20 years of history of security issues that we hit. It's not like IT learned that stuff the easy way. You know, we got compromised, we had problems, we had issues, and so we learned to build processes. Unfortunately, those processes really slowed us down. And the other thing we recognized is when we started to move towards a more cloud-native approach, we were like, well, we'll just do alerting. We'll just basically get alerts every time there's something we need to pay attention to. That really quickly got out of control. I mean, it just became whack-a-mole. There was just no way to keep up with it. And I have alert fatigue on here is, is what we talk about. And that is getting those Slack message or emails and how do you know which one to pay attention to? What are the important areas? Because the reality is of 20,000 changes an hour you're dealing with, there's going to be one of those that might be really important. And you may have a hard time identifying which one of those you need to pay attention to. So really, th this is really about a signal and noise problem. With all these things going on, how do you reduce all of the noise so that you can focus on the signal? And at the end of the day, they have to leverage automation to do that. There's just no way that we can leverage traditional IT process to use a runbook to correct problems, to contact the person, to talk to them about making the change. By the time that's occurred, the application has been torn down and redeployed three times. Yeah. Right? So you need to be able to get rid of the noise, leveraging automation, so that your IT staff, so your security staff, so your SecOps, so your cloud ops have the ability to focus on that 10% that they need to be dealing with on a more manual and active basis. And so with that, I mean, you really start to look at and say that traditional IT perimeter and processes that we've always used and relied upon are ineffective. You just can't handle those kind of changes at scale. They're still important. I'm not, I'm not mitigating the fact of perimeter control, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that, about how that begins to fold in. But it's really so important, particularly as, as Brian talked about, to be able to filter out the noise. And so, you know, as you, you step back and think about it, for those of you who are, who are working in those large enterprise firms is, you know, think about, at least for me, the, the IT procurement process, our, our development teams literally had, they knew in their head, probably an extra 60 to 90 days in the schedule. They, they committed, but they figured by the time things get through procurement, backlog of servers making it to the data center, by the time they get it in, they rack it, put it in, uh, put up the operating system, get it networked. We're looking at somewhere between 90, 120 days. I've even seen as long as 180 days to get procured services into the data center. And so those kind of processes, as Brian was talking about, when you're standing up something to try to detect it and resolve it, that resource may have already been built and gone. And I know you certainly experienced that at EA. Yeah, I mean, certainly, I mean, if we had waited 180 days, the games <laughs> get built and thrown away in 180 days, right? So you have to be able to move more quickly. Yeah. And I think the other thing we saw was not just the time it took to provision. I mean, that certainly took a lot of time. And yeah. I'm never going to rack another server again. Um, but, <laughs> but certainly the other thing we saw was just when you were going through this process and working with engineering and trying to talk about the problems they're going to face when they start to adopt cloud yeah. and you're going through that transformation, sometimes people don't understand the scale of the attack surface. Mm. And so what I mean is the offensive nature of what's going on out there. So we used to have an exercise we do with our engineers as they come on board. We'd have them deploy a server into a secured environment mm. where if port 22 open to the world yeah. and completely publicly accessible, and we just set like root root on password and login. Yep. And we just have them time it. How long does it take before that box gets popped? And sometimes when you go through the exercise, it opens your eyes to the amount of things that are just out there scanning and looking and trying to find ways in. I mean, when, you know, yeah. 10 or 12 years ago, there was an increase in the amount of sophisticated exploits that were being developed. That's actually started to dovetail down a little bit, primarily because it's not necessary anymore. Mm. People are out there opening up S3 buckets or yeah. leaving databases open to the world. I know that hasn't happened. No. Uh, like those things. And so it's not necessary yeah. to spend time and energy and resources in those really complex exploits when you can just scan and find a way in. Yeah. And so that's part of this equation is not only understanding as security professionals what scale looks like internally, but also training the engineering organization about what's important about security, how they need to deploy, how they need to think about people trying to get in, because you can help teach them as they go through this process, everyone's going to raise. Like, everything's going to get better, you're going to get faster and more innovative. Well, just think about your own SLAs, right? I mean, what would be an SLA from you know, a typical event in a data center to when you're going to respond to it? How much data could be lost if you had that, you know, that uh, cloud storage open to the world? So those are, the, those are the things to think about. And so how do you begin to, to really think about it from a remediation standpoint, right? So the first off is it needs to be near, near real time, right? 
And so as you go around, it's really starting at a harvesting point. So utilizing all the access points, those APIs across all those resources and harvesting them back real time, not only upon creation, but actually upon change. It's that day two drift to also think about. Things might have been great as you deployed it out of the CI CD tool chain, but what happened after that point with that engineer? I, I honestly don't think, and I, one, I really don't believe people intentionally do a lot of the configuration mistakes they do, but it's that middle of the night, day two ops, when something's wrong, I'll change that back as soon as it's resolved, and it doesn't get resolved. It doesn't get flipped back, right? So to, you first got to harvest that data back in, then you want to unify it so that it's consistent across all of your individual accounts, all of your VPCs, all those resources are then normalized into a single data plane. Then you want to drive analysis against it. So as you thought about establishing those compliance and security policies of what does it mean to our organization to be compliant, that's the analysis that gets done real time against those resources. And then being able to take action. What do I want to have happen when this occurs? So it's that if then this scenario, if port 22 is open to the world, what do I want to do? Who do I want to wake up? What immediate action do I want to take? Not only to protect the company, but also from a forensics perspective, as well as to learn, right? Was it the team that in inadvertently did it to resolve an issue or were we actually breached? So all that data is captured and dumped off for analytics. So I'm gonna dive yeah. one thing on sure. Unify. I mean, everyone saw this morning's announcement, right? About the multi-cloud push from Google. Yeah. This is absolutely, the right way to go. I'm super excited about they're doing this and they're doing it on top of Kubernetes. Kubernetes is going to be the element that breaks down the barriers and commoditizes infrastructure. And so at the end of the day, it's going to be really important from the enterprise organization perspective when you're looking at the infrastructure layer that you can have a unified model because you're going to have engineers who are using Azure. You're going to have engineers who are using GCP. You're going to have engineers using Amazon. And you can't build policies that are going to be just living in those worlds because you're going to forget about them, or they're going to sort of die on the vine, or in different ways that go on. And as we know in security, it doesn't matter if you have 95% coverage. That 5% is the one that's going to get you. Yeah. So you need to make sure you have a create holistic strategy and holistic policy as you move, move forward. So how do you do that? Well, there's lots of different ways to think about dealing with this using remediation. One is, you know, in a development environment, your remediation might be slightly different than in your production environment. In your development environment, you might say, look, engineer, you, you want to do some latency testing. Uh, I work for a big bank. We are not allowed to have servers outside the United States, but you want to do some latency testing. So in the development environment, you can spin up an instance in Asia Pack for the next two hours. Two hours later, our system's going to automatically come back and clean it up and make sure everything's OK. But when you move that same application to the staging, you may not actually have that ability to do that. You might leverage more you know, faster remediation. A server comes on Asia Pack, it's killed instantly, right? But you still want to let them have that ability to try new services and do more things, right? You don't want to lock them down using preventative controls because you need them to go in there and try new things. You need them to innovate. And if you block them at the, la at the top layer, they're just going to go around you. They'll go create an account and try it themselves. And that's the worst thing you can be in. Being compromised is bad. Being compromised and not knowing it is way worse, right? So embrace this. Help them innovate. Help them learn. Go through that process with them and leverage remediation in real time to be able to provide flexibility about how they do that. But then when you get to production, this is where you may want to leverage some preventative controls. The cloud providers today provide different ways to do preventative controls and lock down certain services are being used. So as you're taking your engineer through this journey, Right? You want them to, each stage, understand it's a little bit more stringent. It's a little bit tighter. It's a little bit harder to do what you're going to do if it doesn't fall inside the parameters of what we've approved. To when they get production, it just doesn't work. Right? But they're not surprised by the time they get there, because the whole way through the journey, you've been teaching them. And what's more important about that is it's not just about enforcing a policy and then just running away. Right? It's about engaging them. It's about bringing them into the conversation say, what is it you're trying to accomplish? What are you trying to do? Let me help you find a secure way of doing that help them innovate and help them along that journey. Let me interject there. I mean, and, and Brian's going to talk about it on the next slide, but think about it too, is it's, it's, as he's mentioned, this funnel of restriction. You're providing guardrails that are much wider in that early stage to, to generate innovation, but by the time you are at stage three, it's, it's, it's least privileged, right? It, in fact, in many cases, it's just going to be machine-only privileges that are enabled in production to be able to, to, to run those services. And so we'll talk here in that next layer about how you get there. Yeah, yeah. So let's talk about these different layers. It's sort of like you can almost think about super fine grained up to more coarse grain, right? So in your what we call protect mode, 
Right? This is where you're leveraging rem real-time remediation to go in and clean up after things or shut things down or clean up security groups, whatever it might be, right? Identify databases that have not been connected to in a long time. All those different elements are going in, automating, cleaning up, fixing, that kind of stuff, and you're protecting your environment on a regular basis. Then you have your in-flight checks. Right? So this is your ability to take things like Terraform or CloudFormation templates or anything you need to work with to be able to deploy into your environment and provision, maybe Helm chart. Right, you'll be able to deploy into that infrastructure and have the engineers integrate with a tool that will allow it to check those things as they're doing it. So when they're going through the CI CD process, it checks in with the system and goes, hey, I'm about to build these 10 resources. This is what it looks like. Is this OK? Right? Have the CI CD process then either pass it and say, yeah, you're allowed to do this because it's development, but we're going to tell you this is a problem, or have it just straight fail the build. Right? You want to integrate and bring security into their world, not the other way around. Again, if you try and do that, they're just going to find it annoying and go around you. So how do you, go, how do you bring it in? Right? So those in-flight checks are really important. And then finally, these, this sort of landing spaces, this idea that as you provision accounts, uh, you do it in an automated fashion. And when you do that for projects or teams or whatever it might be, you go in and start slapping controls around it at provision time. And this might be a mixture of remediation and preventative measures. Uh, you might enforce some sort of ability through a CI CD pipeline where it gets getting checked as it goes. All those sort of tighten things around as you go into a more production and preventative bleh, accounts. There we go. And really, and, and so those really go in combination, right? So those those coarse grain or those big mindsets that say these are never, you know, never to you know be violated, if you will, down to that mid grain where, as as Brian talked about you may put a warning there in that dev cycle, but you're not going to shut it down immediately because you also are, sh are facing into that cultural shift, right? So you also want to educate engineering as to why we are going that direction. Down to those fine-grained controls that not only take care of upon launch, but really that drift that can occur day two, day 30. So those really combined with some of the things that we talked about on the previous slide around the cycle aspect gives us, so for those of the leaders in the room, gives us that ability to become more the department of yes to drive innovation for your company versus the department of no. Look, I think the, 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 the high level key takeaway here is that as, as everyone goes down this journey, you need to define a strategy for the organization. It, it can't, this is not a, that's why we started out talking about the fact that this is not just a technology problem. This is how a business is gonna transform. When I was at EA and we were building games, the introduction of cloud didn't just change how we deployed our applications. It literally changed what applications we built. It changed what games we took to market. It changed which games we decided to stop developing on because we were able to do it faster, right? So it's a huge business transformation. So as you go through this process, you decide how security, how IT, how cloud ops is going to address this. It's important to think about it as a holistic strategy, right? So we talk about that, those layers, you know, all the way from development into production needs to be taken into consideration and how you engage your engineering staff and teach them as they go. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think, as Brian mentioned earlier around filtering out the noise, we, we can't rely on the traditional, just the perimeter security control and just providing notification. Okay, it's great to know that there's a theft happening in aisle five, but have we filtered out the noise to know exactly where and pinpoint what's, what is happening, where it's happening, and how to resolve it, and then be able to take that action to remediate it in a time of cloud speed? The other thing, so we're out there on a regular basis working with large enterprise customers solving for the strategic problem. And one of the things that we found is the companies that tend to have most success or are able to get moving the quickest have an established cloud ops team. Right? Yeah. This is sort of interesting because when we talk about security, there's this desire to think about traditional infrastructure security. This is about analyzing network traffic and identifying external threats and coming up with preventative measures to react to those threats. But the security problem we're facing right now is different than what we've seen before. Um, I used to do exploit development professionally for a while. And so from the offensive side, you're thinking about things slightly different. You're thinking about how to get into a black box. From the security side, when you're defending against that, you're looking at traffic to try and figure out what people are throwing at you, what do they know about you that you don't know, and so on and so forth. When you're dealing with the cloud ops side of things and helping engineer teams grow, it's much more about understanding what they're doing and what their needs are, making sure they don't make mistakes. It's an internal threat. And it's very yeah. different because it turns out you and them are on the same side. <laughs> right? you're, not, you're not fighting one another. So you have to find a way to embrace that. And what we've found is by establishing a cloud center of excellence, a cloud ops team that's going to be focused on security from a cloud perspective, and what that means to the internal organization means you get a lot more innovation a lot quicker. 
And I, I think to add to that is my experience has also been is that having that focal team, that cloud ops team also helps as an accelerant, not only from an adoption perspective, but also from an educational cultural perspective across the entire organization as, as folks begin to transition out of that data center mindset. In many cases, you're gonna be, I mean, my experience has been again, that most organizations of that size are gonna always be hybrid. They're gonna have their data center with their large ERP systems and others that will remain in, on, on, on prem. But to be able to manage that mindset across the board, it helps to have that cloud ops team. Absolutely.